Good morning, Church of the Rock. I hope you guys are having a great morning. My name is Parks Pierce. I'm one of the elders here at Church of the Rock, and uh, it's always an honor for me to step in place of Pastor Mike while he's on vacation and bring the good word to you guys. Um, so I, I missed you last weekend. Uh, me and my family uh, and two other families actually went down to, uh, well, it was in between Waterbury and Stowe. Uh, we got a little house there for the weekend. Man, it was the most gorgeous location. You could see the mountains in the back. Uh, there was a pond down below. Uh, there were six kids at all uh, in total. So just a lot of laughter, a lot of fellowship, uh, a lot of just talking life, and just playing with the kids. Um, uh, one of the funny stories from the weekend was at one point, I, how I managed to get down there by myself, but I was at the pond uh, with all four of the girls. Uh, and, and their ages are nine years old down to, to six, six years old. All four of them have fishing poles or princess Barbie poles, hooks everywhere. At one point, Charlie's got her line over here. Uh, Kelly throws hers way across hers, tangles that up. Lillian's caught over here on a rock or a stone. And then as I'm trying to get that one off, Mary Kate tries to cast and just catches me in, in, in the back. Like, all right, poles down. No more fishing. <laughs> get to the house now. But man, we had such a good time. Uh, it's just some much needed R&R, &R, uh, but we still missed you guys. Uh, so anyway, glad to be here this morning. Uh, the scripture that we're going to talk, uh, talk to this morning, if you have any sort of background or history in church, uh, you'll know the scriptures. You'll at least know the themes of these. It's the you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world scriptures. Uh, and those scriptures come in Matthew chapter 5. Uh, and Math Matthew chapter 5 is part of Jesus' early ministry. So he's, he's new on the scene. He's like the, new, he's like the new thing, like the new hit. Everybody wants to come see him. Everybody wants to hear him. And uh, as, he's weighed, as he's made his way teaching and, and, and healing people, dude, I'm talking folks from other countries are walking just to hear him. Like, there were no cars back then. Uh, and, and there wasn't no social media either. So the fact that people from all over heard about this guy and wanted to see him, it's just miraculous in itself. Like we, I don't know what we'd do without Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all that stuff, which, look, I don't hate those things. I don't. I just really, really despise them. Um, and Jesus did all these things without Facebook. But you know what? Let's talk about Facebook for a second. Can you imagine if Jesus had a Facebook page? Can you imagine sitting there at your breakfast table, sipping your coffee, scrolling through, and seeing things that Jesus has done. Oh, uh, Jesus just checked into uh, Jerusalem. Huh. He just brought a dude back to life. Ha. Huh. Oh, oh, look at this. He just calmed the storm with the snap of his fingers. So Facebook like that, I think it'd be pretty cool. But outside of that, I'm out. So he's doing all this without social media. Now let me tell you about who's in attendance to this. So there's thousands of people there. Like, you don't know the gravity of having thousands of people there to listen to one man. It's so many people that he literally had to go on to a mountain. That's why it's called the Sermon on the Mount. Oh, I didn't come up with that. Sermon on the Mount. He had to get on top of there where the, just the curvature of the mountain just acted as acoustics. It, it served as kind of an amphitheater. Because thousands of people there without speakers and stuff, it's the only way you could possibly get it done. So they came from everywhere. And, and, and here, here, here's another cool thing about it. The people in attendance were a smorgasbord of people. Educated people, uneducated people, rich people, broke people, every different ethnicity you could think of, every socioeconomic status you can think of, people with Nikes on, people with no shoes on, didn't matter. Down south we say everybody was there. And that's a, that's a huge thing because here's a nugget from that. That tells me that Jesus, when he's, when he's reading the scriptures and he's saying, you are the salt of the earth, he's talking to everybody there. They're, they're following Christ. They're the disciples of Christ. And he's saying, you all are the salt of the earth. So that tells me that it's not, a, it's not just an invitation for one set of group of people. No, 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 no. It's saying it's an open invitation for everybody. 
So with that said, let me read it. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything, anything, except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Now, i got to do this. Um, if I could see you guys, it would be a lot better, but I wish you could just raise your hand. If, if you grew up in any church or went to any vacation Bible school or anything, where you sang the song, This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Well, that song came from this verse. And if you're with me, I wish you could sing along with me, but you can see why I'm not on a worship team, but whatever. Mind your business. I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bush. Oh, no. I'm going to let it shine. Anyway, so there's the scriptures, and it was open invitation to all. Now, to go further, we have to talk about what salt is now, what salt was back then. Um, salt back then um, was used as a preservative. Like, you didn't just go down to Bob's Meat Market back then, grab a couple steaks, throw a few on the grill, and throw the rest in the fridge there. Well, no freezers, well, no refrigerators, what? So you sprinkled some salt on the meat, and it kept it. It kept it from decaying for a little bit, not a long time. So Jesus is saying, you're the salt of the earth as a preservative. He's saying us as a church are to be a preservative agent to fight off the darkness, the moral decay of society. That's what we're supposed to do. Be the salt and push back on the moral decay of society. Uh, what else does salt do? Salt adds flavor. We use salt today to add flavor. It did it back then. So Jesus is saying, as a church, we are to be a flavor in our town, in our community, that just it adds flavor and people want that. Okay? Uh, what else does salt do? They use salt as a, as a fertilizer. So as a church, we are to be a fertilizing agent so that we, we have ground where we can have spiritual growth. Like, uh, if we're being salt uh, that acts as a fertilizer, we're promoting and creating ground that allows and helps for spiritual growth. Um, lastly, salt makes you thirsty. It just does. And so Jesus is kind of saying that we as a church are to be out in the culture, in the society, where when people are around us, they are thirsty for what we got. And what we got is Christ. So we're to be the salt. We're to be the thirst agent. So when people are around us, they go, man, I don't know what they got, but I want it. Uh, and all those things, I have no doubt that's, that's part of what Jesus wanted us to know, what salt is. But for today, I want to take a step further. I want us to think about salt as the physical act of, of, of inhaling spiritually. So like taking in a deep breath spiritually, like when we decide to choose and follow Christ, at that moment, the Holy Spirit is in us, lives in us, going to live in us forever. And as he lives in us, he, he starts molding us and he starts chiseling us so that we can be more in the image of Christ. And as that's happening, as we're, as we're spiritually inhaling and becoming that salt, becoming more like Christ, then and only then are we able to go out into the world and be the light of the world. But we're going to talk more today about what happens when we lose our saltiness. How do we lose our saltiness? And it's basically when we, we go from inhaling spiritually and getting closer to Christ and, and growing in more intimacy towards Him and just getting in deeper relationship with Him to we forget to breathe out. What happens when you, when you breathe in and you forget to breathe out? You pass out. You die. It doesn't happen. Same thing with spiritual growth. As you inhale spiritually, you get closer to Christ, but then you just stop and there's no longer any transformation in your works, in your life, so that there's no chance of going out and being light to the world. That's what we're going to cover today. Um, 
Here's one funny example um, of, of doing that is we, we all at one time probably have decided, you know what, <clears throat> I'm a little chunky. I'm going to lose a little bit of weight. I'm going to get healthy. I'm going to get back in shape. Uh, and along those lines, we might have done something like this. Joined a gym. We might have joined two gyms. We might have joined every gym in town. We might have went to Google, found out best ways to diet, the things to eat, what protein shakes are the best. We might have figured out what our macros is going to be. That's for you, Allie and Ben and, and whoever else from the gym. We might have figured out what our macros is going to be. Long story short, we do all these things to find out the best fat burners, the best foods to eat, the best gyms. And we do all that stuff. But you know what we don't do? We don't step one pinky toe in a gym. We don't lift one dumbbell. And we go to bed at night with Orioles on our lap and wake up with a milk mustache. <laughs> Anybody else done that but me? Well, it happens. And it's the same thing. If we are losing our saltiness, it's because we have decided to, we've been inhaling and we stop exhaling. So we stop the transformation, just ends. Like we might still be doing some things. We might still be buying the magazines of what exercises to do. We might keep our gym membership. We might even talk to some friends about what to do. But as soon as that transformation stops, we ain't going to the gym, we're not eating healthy, but we're eating cookies at night, that's when our saltiness goes it's out. And from there, there's no way, zero chance to be light of the world. Zero. We become masters of information and not masters of life. That's what happens. Uh, our church overall, I don't think you would, I don't think you would argue with me that overall our church, we've lost our saltiness. And this could this has happened over hundreds of years. We've lost our saltiness. I mean, look at look at the uh, the persecution that we kind of face now. We've kind of taken God out of church at schools, prayer out of schools. Uh, we don't really say the Pledge of Allegiance anymore. Um, if we do, it's quiet. You can say it here. Um, We've lost our saltiness as a church because it's evident that we get people make fun of us, people poke fun of us, and for good reason. We 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 will say what we believe, but we don't necessarily show that on the street in the world. We've lost our saltiness, um, and I want to talk. Um, well, here's another example. Here's the reason I can tell you that we've lost our saltiness. There's things in our world, in our life, that we as Christ followers in the church, we just should be doing a better job of than folks outside the church. How we manage our money, how we manage our debt, our marriages. Not really doing a better job in our marriages than, than the non-church people. We're not. The divorce rate might even be higher within the church than it is outside the church. What about chasing the consumerism? I mean, consumerism is, is crazy today. Got to have the newest, biggest, and baddest. Oh, got to keep up with the Jones. Are we doing a better job with consumerism as a non-church? The answer is no. And so when we losing our saltiness there, it's easier to poke a little fun at us. And so they are. And we can't really say, we deserve that. In a nutshell, if you breathe in, no transformation there. And there's no, you're not getting closer in intimacy with Christ. There's no other choice but for us to be tossed out, trampled on by men, and zero light in the world. Zero. Now, I think there's some, some things in this world that work against us. No doubt. There's some things in our life, in our culture, society, there are obstacles, and we struggle with. Uh, and I want to talk about a few of those today uh, because they're there. Um, when I grew up, uh, I... I grew up in a small Baptist church in Missouri. And you can count on, in the back of every pew in that church, there'd be this pink envelope. Every pew. And on that envelope, on that envelope, it would have a place for you to write your name. You could stick your money inside if you want to put your offering in there. But it had these little boxes on there, little checklist boxes. 
One would say, did you read your Bible daily? Absolutely. Check. Did you pray daily? Dear Lord, thank you for today. Amen. Yes, I did. Did you invite anybody to church? Oh, let me just text Joe. Let me text Paul. Would you come to church today? Ah, oh, sin. Check. Okay? That's a checklist of things to do. Silly? Yeah, kind of. But today, one of the things that I think is an obstacle for us, I know it is, is I think there's an undue importance that we place on, on width, on like having a checklist over depth, over getting deep, over having a deep relationship with Christ. So what happens is we just have these checklists of things. Oh, I read my Bible. I went to church. I called somebody. I, I did this. I did that. I'm good. Instead, nowhere along, the, nowhere along the line did you get closer to Christ. There's no transformation. So absolutely, I think there's an undue importance over width, over depth. You can read a bunch of books. You can read your Bible. But you're not... You're not pouring any of that into anybody's life. There's no discipleship there. There's no down on your knees begging God to, to, to transform your heart, to get closer to him. None of that. Just a checklist. Oh, and if you feel like you got everything checked off, we're good. So I do think we have that uh, fighting against us. Uh, another thing that I know is a, is a detriment to us is just the speed of life in general. Man, we live in a world where it's like you can have anything you want right now. Like right now. My wife's probably buying something on Amazon. It'll be on our front porch tonight. I'm not just making that up for the sermon. It's probably happening. And I'm sure some of you guys do that too. But it's the same with anything. Dude, can you imagine if you go out to eat on a Friday, Saturday night, and you got a group of 10 people. I don't care what restaurant you go to. And you pull in, they tell you it's like a two-hour wait. What do you do? God, seriously? Like... What do you expect, man? It's Friday night at 8 o'clock. There's going to be a wait. So what do you do? Get in. Let's, let's go find somewhere else. Like there's going to be another place that, that, that can sit 10 of you at 8 o'clock. So you send another kid in there and they come back with the same store. Go! So then what do you do? Ah, uh, let's just call Eastern Dragon. <laughs> All right, that's just what we do. Eastern Dragon on a Friday night at 8. You can feed 30 people $22. And it's ready in five minutes. I think I drank too, too much of my energy drink today. Y'all have to bear with me. Another example is, is, is watching your kids grow. Hey, you can't actually see them grow. I could sit Charlie in front of me and watch her for three months. I can't hear her bone stretch. I can't hear her, her hair grow. I can measure it. I can stand her up, put the marker on her head. I can measure it, but I can't see her grow. It just doesn't happen. But a detriment to live in that fast-paced life when it comes to spiritual growth is that sometimes we give up all too soon. And I think you know what I'm talking about. Like say, say your marriage has been a train wreck for 15 years. You decide to give Jesus a chance. You come to church. You come to church for six months. Your marriage is still a wreck. So you quit. Well, I gave Jesus a try. Thank you very much for your six months. Like he's just some sort of uh, genie dust Jesus that's going to sprinkle some magic dust over your marriage. When it's been a wreck for 15 years, you give him, you give him a few months. All right, what about uh, folks that have been battling addiction or battling anything for, for 20 years? You come to church for a year, and after that year, you're still battling those same temptations. And so you go, you know what? I gave God a try. Ow. Thank you. Thank you. No. Look, when you accept Christ and you follow him, you're going to become more and more like him the rest of your life. Hey, if I could see your hands again, I'd ask you to raise your hand if there's any sin or anything that you struggle with that you've been struggling with since the day you accepted Christ. Am I all alone? I'm going to bet I'm not. I'm going to bet I'm not. There's things you're always going to battle with. There's things that always Christ wants you to completely give up to him every single day. And along the way, you will have that spiritual growth. But you can't give up on it. Give up on it. It's going to be no transformation. You're not going to be the salt of the earth. So speed of life is an absolute killer to some of us. 
We're also, we're also, this is point number three, we're also a culture where we, we just love comfort too much. Like us as a church almost hate conflict and confrontation and trials way too much. Like we live in a world where our t-shirts would say, kick your feet up, grab a glass, sit back and relax. When in reality, us as Christians, Jesus is going, no, 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 uh -uh. take up your cross and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. Because in doing that, you're going to have confrontation. You're going to have trials. And you're going to love them. And we're going we're to do this together. And my kingdom is going to be glorified because of that. But no, we like that comfort. We like that comfort. We do. Another thing is, we just, we don't know who our neighbors are in our world today. Like, Jesus specifically tells us the most important command is to love him, love God, with all our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength, our power. That's it. That's the most important thing. And the second thing is to love our neighbors as ourselves. Love our neighbors as ourselves. Look at what's happening in the world today. Man, we're so divided. Everything's we versus them. Hey, we'll never get political in our church, and this isn't political at all, but I'm telling you right now, it doesn't matter who wins the election coming up. It doesn't matter uh, what lives matter. It doesn't. What matters is, is that we serve Jesus, the King of all kings, we, we, yes, are we supposed to do our job here on earth? Yeah, vote, love our neighbors, but hey, I got one king, and that's Jesus. And like I said, no matter who wins the election, everything, it's not, it's not like the world's gonna change. I serve Jesus, I serve that king. And to know who our neighbors are, look at the story in Luke. I, I'd go there, it's Luke, Luke 10, starting in verse 25. It's when an attorney stands up and tries to test Jesus and say, what do I need to do to get into heaven? And that's when Jesus says, love me with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, power, everything. And then love your neighbors as yourself. And then the guy he tries to pipe up again and say, well, who, who are my neighbors? And he tells the story of uh, 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 the guy that got beaten down and robbed uh, on the road to Jericho. And, and, the, and the three pass him. The, the priest passes by, doesn't help him. The Levite passes by, doesn't help him. And then, but then the Samaritan does. The Samaritan, the half-breed, the, 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 the one that's low on the socioeconomic status pole. I mean, the, the, the least obvious choice of all. I mean, matter of fact, back then, the Jews and other groups would pray to God that they wouldn't even hear the Samaritan's prayers. Like, that's some hate there. Like, we're dealing with some divisiveness now in this world, and it's there, but back then it was just as bad, if not worse. I mean, to pray, Lord, hear our prayers. I'm just not that guy. That's pretty bad. That's some hatred there. And who's the one that helps him out? The Samaritan. And he says, he's the one that showed compassion. You go and do likewise. He's your neighbor. And the guy that tests him, the, 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 the attorney, wouldn't even call him a Samaritan. He, he kept calling him the one. He wouldn't even say the word Samaritan. That's bad. I got a group of friends in, in Dallas. Uh, <laughs> it's so funny, man. We, we talk about if we had a reality show of just us friends, the world would be a better place. Because that group of friends has a white guy and me, a black guy, a uh, Hispanic, an Asian, uh, an Irishman. Uh, uh, we've got a Hawaiian and a Vietnamese guy in there. And we are like the best of friends. Are we all Christians? Nope. Do we agree on everything in politics? Nope. But do we love the mess out of each other? Absolutely we do. And when we go golfing or we go grab dinner, people look at us because like we're a smorgasbord of ethnicities and we're loving each other and we're laughing. And if we just had a reality show of that, man, I think the ratings would be sky high. So somebody want to fund that? Call me. I'll, I'll, I'll get that together. Love your neighbors as yourself. And that's everybody, everybody, not just us in the church, not just those in your small group. It's everybody, everybody is your neighbor. All right, where am I? Okay. Another thing that I think holds us back uh, from being salt and transforming that and being a lot of the world is I just don't think we have uh, the sense of deep community that we're supposed to be living in. 
And what I mean by deep community is like for spiritual growth to happen, two things have to happen in there. You have to have encouragement and rebuke. Now look, none of us have a problem with encouragement. We all like a pat on the back. You're doing good. Go get him. Hey, we're here with you. Mm, you're so good at that. We all love that. And we probably have a lot of friends that give that to us. That's not the hard part. But we need that as well as the other part, the rebuke. Now look at me. People handle rebuke, Christians and non-Christians, in one of two ways. Just, it is the way it is. You get rebuked, you either go, oh, man, I know. I stink at that. I, I quit. Or you go like this. Ah, well, it's funny that um, you noticed the uh, speck in my eye. Because um, I see this huge log in your big fat head. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? You either go, oh, I stink. Or you go, huh, I'm glad that you pointed out some sin that you see in my life. Because um, as we were talking, I see some sin in your life. But to have that deep community that progresses on to us having spiritual growth you got to have both encouragement and rebuke. And I'm talking, hey, you don't get that just by your surface level friends. And I'm not saying you got to have a million of them. But you got to have some of them where you have the deep community, where you have brothers and sisters that you're rubbing elbows with who are going to call you out when they see you're slacking on something. Because they love you and they want to see your pursuit of Christ just strengthen. But I think we're missing a boat on that. I think we're just relying on a lot of surface level relationships and not getting to that deep community that I think we have to have for that spiritual growth to commence, which leads us to being light of the world. Now, there's your salt piece. <clears throat> now onto the light of the world piece. One of the biggest nuggets I want to talk about as being light of the world is I think we just overcomplicate what it means to be the light of the world. Um, what I mean by that is really two things. One, first one is, you need to be, you ought to be the light of the world, wherever you are, in whatever you do for a living, wherever you roll, whatever circles you're in, that's where you're called to be the light of the world. Ben File, he's a lineman, he's a member of our church. He is the light of the world in that domain. He goes to work, he's a lineman, that's what he does for a living. People. People are thirsty for Christ when they're around him. At work, that's where he's a light of the world. Um, one of our CrossFit coaches, Allie, she's a nutritionist, a life coach. So when people come to her and they want to get healthy, they want to get in shape, the area, her arena that she plays in to, to be Christ and be light of the world is right there. Like she's helping people better themselves and they're going to see, they're going to thirst for what she has She's going to be sprinkling that fertilizer for spiritual growth to happen. That's where she's going to be light of the world. And on and on and on it goes. I could list everybody in, in our church. Jody White. I called him for coffee months ago. Uh, and he couldn't make it because he was training families who had been battling addiction, who have recovered, but are trying to get a foothold on life, trying to figure out how to budget money how to get a job, how to keep a job. And he was leading a training to do that because he had been in their shoes before. Brothers and sisters, that is being light of the world in your own domain. So don't overcomplicate that. And another thing is, we're to be the light of the world. Not, not, not just our church, not just your small group, not just the guys in your gym, everywhere. Light of the world. Hey, look, I love you, church. I love my church people. I do. I love every one of you. And I have to have you. Like, I, I need those relationships. I need to be around good church folk. But I got, some bro I, got some, I got some friends that aren't church folk, and I just need to be around those guys from time to time. Like, I just do. Like, no, nothing, against, nothing against church people, but I need to be around some grimy, some rough I got some buddies that just have potty mouths, man. They, they make a sailor blush. I got some friends that say if they step foot into church, the walls are going to come down. And I got to be around them. 
I love them. Not just to be the light to them. I, I, they help me out. Like I, so I love you church folks. But God doesn't call us to just be with church folks. We're to be light of the world. And that's some broken down, messed up people, struggling folks. And that's where you're to be light of the world. If you're light, he says, don't put it in a basket. Uh, -uh Don't hide it. You, shine, you let it shine. Just like the song says, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Not going to let Satan put it out. Uh-uh. I'm going to let it. All right, too much energy drink. So, in wrapping up this message, I want to challenge you to uh, realize that us as a church, we've lost, we've lost some saltiness, guys. We have. It's evident. And I want you to think about being salt. It's breathing in. Breathing in Christ. Doing whatever it takes. Being on your hands and knees. Pleading to be closer in tune with Him. So that you can go out and be light to the world. The whole world. So I challenge you. What, what in your life are you not walking in obedience in? Those things that you know you need to be in obedience to. But you're just not right now. And it's causing you to lose that flavor. It's causing you to, to not fight off the moral decay of today as much as you should. Wrestle through those. Pray for help, Lord, so that you can get salty again. And then when you do that, you can go out and be light to the world. I love you guys so much. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you. We want to get on our hands and knees right now. Thank you for today. Thank you for just letting us breathe in that salt, just becoming salt, Lord. We pray for transformation. We pray that you would take all those things that hinder us, all the checklists, all the things that lead to us not having transformation, all the things that lead to us not getting in closer relationship with you. We want to stop that, Lord, and we want to pray that you eliminate those and that our affections will just be stirred up from you and all the things that rob us of those affections will just be tossed out so that we have the transformation, Lord, so we can get salty again and we can go out into the world and be light. We love you so much, Lord. Thank you for loving us. We ask all this in your beautiful and precious name. Amen. Love you guys. Have a great week. <music>